temperance table and indeed underlines that by saying that in the event of a cessation of violence, a sufficient period would have to ensue. And Mr Paisley's response was simple. We will never talk to Sinn Féin. No, we'll not be sitting down at that table ever because uh, the only time that you can exercise forgiveness is when there's repentance. But here we have a sop given to these people. They're being bought to go to the table. They've got exactly what they wanted. Of course, this government has been flirting with Sinn Féin IRA for some time. And I have some evidence of secret meetings that have taken place between the Northern Ireland office officials and Sinn Féin. And I think this is part of that. And Tom Bradby joins us now live from Belfast. Tom, we heard the uh, rather dark overtones there of the Reverend Ian Paisley. Any independent confirmation at all about these talks that Jerry Adams talked about? Uh, no, not as yet. These rumours, I should say, have been circulating for some days and there is no uh, further source to, to substantiate them. There is, however, a rumour in Belfast uh, that's been around uh, today and yesterday that there is some documentary evidence that would confirm these rumours. But I think it, it, it will remain to be seen over the coming days whether, whether Mr Adams can produce evidence to, to suggest that these meetings did really take place. And I should say that I spoke to a, a senior government source over the weekend who denied privately that these meetings took place. He said categorically, uh, no, without any question. But on the question of the possibility of talks with Sinn Féin if the violence ceases, by and large, a rather cool reception from all the constitutional parties. Yes, I, I think so. I think the explanation for that is that they don't see a, a great change as yet. That may emerge in the coming days. And I think that what they see in it is an attempt to bring the British government line uh, much closer to the Irish government line and to draw the two close together and to cancel out any suggestion of a rift. But, but I do sense, particularly from the Ulster Unionists, perhaps a, a slightly more conciliatory tone, uh, perhaps slightly similar to the government, uh, choosing to emphasise not the uh, negative effects of terrorism, but choosing to tell Sinn Féin, look, um, if you do stop violence, if you do reject violence and move away from it, you will eventually be allowed into the democratic process. Tom Bradbury in Belfast, thank you very much indeed. Mr Major also tackled other controversial policy areas tonight, not least Sir Edward Heath's criticism of his back-to-basics philosophy. The Prime Minister didn't refer to Sir Edward by name, but insisted his only concern is for the future. Here's our political correspondent, Mark Webster. A grand setting for this defence of his main political theme. Mr Major's critics have derided his talk back to basics as nostalgia masking a moral crusade against groups like Lone Parent. But he insisted he was looking to the future to promote underlying British values and instincts. Basic social values like self-discipline, respect for the law, concern for others, a greater acceptance of personal responsibility and family obligations. A concentration on education with an understanding that it's not just about training for work. It is a wider preparation for life and it involves parents as well as teachers. It means learning the values of our society as well as the rules. He went on to warn Some Europe was becoming uncompetitive he said Britain needed to keep a flexible labour market as well as a skilled, well-educated workforce. Raising standards in education will be difficult, but our children must be taught what they need to know to succeed in later life. That's why we need rigorous inspection, a national curriculum, national testing and openness about results. While this week's Queen's speech will show how the government plans to put some of its ideas into practice, the opposition said he was merely trying to repair the damage done by his own government. Mark Webster, News at 10, Westminster. Michael Jackson's lawyer said tonight the pop superstar was barely able to function at an intellectual level. He warned that the singer could take at least six weeks to recover from the addiction to painkillers which forced him to end his concert tour. But there were still no clues about where Jackson is being treated. Anya Sitharam in London has our report. No sign of a pop star, only reports that he's in the French Alps. Mystery deepened when a hotel manager at the ski resort of Avorias said Jackson had been there but had gone, his destination unknown. Speaking in Los Angeles within the last hour, his lawyer was confident Jackson would be cured within weeks. Uh, we believe it will be six to eight weeks. That's somewhat indefinite, like most cures. 
Uh, he certainly intends to return. He'll return when there's a need for his presence here. Uh, or he may just decide to come back as soon as his cure is over. But he is not hiding out. He's not fleeing from anything. He said Jackson isn't being treated in America because he'd have no privacy. When the doctors felt he had to be put into a, a cure situation, he was barely able to function adequately on an intellectual level. From his sister Latoya, who's in South Africa, sympathy, but no clues to his whereabouts. I really can't speak for him, but I'm sure that he's not very happy. I'm sure there's a lot of stress there. I'm sure there's a lot of pain. He's under pressure after being dropped by Pepsi and accused of sex abuse. Jackson says he became hooked on painkillers when he was burned while filming a commercial for Pepsi nine years ago. Painkillers, which contain opiates, can become addictive, but that's comparatively rare. If you're, if you're experiencing pain and you become quite depressed, you may find that you feel that pain is more severe. And some of the strategies in the management of long-term pain is to focus on um, the use of um, psychotherapy methods to treat the depression. Now, come on, let's make some noise here. Come on. This is one of the methods of therapy that Jackson may have. Patients are asked to vent their anger against their addiction. For now, the worldwide media hunt for Jackson continues. All we know for certain is that the pop star is not in America. A sighting in London today turned out to be a stunt. Anya Sitharam, News at 10, Central London. A man who tried to electrocute his wife in the bath has been jailed for 15 years. The 34-year-old property developer planned to collect £600,000 in life insurance and begin a new life with his mistress. Today, the judge said Peter Ellis was a callous, scheming, devious and evil man. Steve Scott was in court. Lisa Ellis was in court to hear again the details of her former husband's calculated plot to kill her and pocket more than half a million pounds in life insurance. Peter Ellis lived a double life, hiding a four-year affair from his wife, concealing his marriage from his lover. At the Cardiff family home, he used his DIY expertise to wire the bath to the main supply. As Mrs. Ellis lay there one evening, she saw a blue flash and her legs went numb. When she jumped out, she noticed the plug chain had melted. If she'd touched the taps, she would have been killed. Shortly before that night, the court heard how devout Christian Ellis told his wife he was joining a church mission in Bosnia. In fact, he spent ten days with his mistress, Mary Francis, in Ibiza. I've had a year of absolute torment, not to mention the eight years before, um, and I'm just so glad it's all over. Fellow worshippers had always suspected Ellis wasn't the saint he pretended to be. Obviously, one felt at times that his uh, supposed religious conviction wasn't a real one, but he was plausible sometimes in explaining it away. Sentencing Ellis to 15 years for attempted murder, the judge, Mr Justice McKinnon, described him as a devious, scheming, callous and evil man. A man who thought he'd planned the perfect crime. Steve Scott, News at 10, Cardiff. Coming next tonight, hear all about it. Will the news you choose become the latest technological craze? The end of Chroma Pier, how the pier was torn apart. And too many of us the are too fat and teenage smoking is up why campaigners blame the government. From the illegal sale of cigarettes to children, I call that living off immoral earnings. <laughs> petrol without detergent, this is what can happen to your engine. Carbon builds up, a major cause of poor acceleration, bad starting and higher fuel consumption. That's why all Shell petrol and diesel has a patented detergent formula. Used regularly, it helps stop carbon building up, giving much better performance. Riding along in my automobile, my baby beside me at the wheel. Use Shell Advanced Petrol. You can tell when it's Shell. The Metro Tahiti has now arrived. 6,520 pounds on the road. 
this Christmas, make sure the sherry you're drinking is Harvey's Bristol Cream. The best sherry in the world. Hello? Oh, Alex. I'm at the British Gas Showroom. Yes, there's so much to look at here. Central heating, tumble dryers, lovely fires. I'm looking at a rather attractive cooker at the moment. The sales assistants are amazingly friendly. Come to look round. What now? There's no need. They've got a catalogue. I'll bring one with me. Don't you just love being in control? For your new copy, free phone 0800 850 900 or visit your gas showroom. Disney's classic, The Jungle Book, is now out on video. Don't monkey about. Get your copy now. Be home, Daddy. Elegant, prestigious, and indulgent. Gold is always desirable. <laughs> Nothing feels or looks quite like it. Mm. Ooh. Because cushion softness and generous thickness are the hallmarks of new Andrex Gold. Throughout evolution, mankind has played the mating game. Why do we long to reproduce when the odds seem so stacked against us? The reason is simple. Having children is the perfect excuse to use Sony's most advanced range of camcorders. Sony, why men really learn to reproduce? Editing news at 10 in your home or office could soon be a reality as part of a revolution in information technology launched today. The marriage of television and computer technology is spawning a new generation of interactive news. And desktop television, combining ITN news and IBM technology, is just the tip of the technological iceberg, as our business correspondent Greg Wood explains. This is how we communicate today. The telephone, the television, and for many of us, the personal computer. But technology is advancing so rapidly that in five years' time, all three functions, and many more, look like being combined in one unit. And it could look something like this. This is News On Demand, a system which allows you to watch the news you want, when you want it, and as often as you want. This is what the viewer will see. First, a menu offering a choice of stories. After selection, text is displayed on one side of the screen, the video report on the other. The user can pause or rewind and start again. Developed initially for insurance companies, the system's on show to delegates at this year's CBI conference. I think it's amazing. It's revolutionary technology, um, which is, is really going to take off in a big way. In this South London street, another marriage of two media. This phone line is being installed by the cable TV company Videotron. Cable is the highway bringing the multimedia revolution into the home. Some of the abilities of a television set, of a telephone, of a computer, of a video games console will gradually merge and become possible through one set-top box, a cable receiver, for example, on your television. Uh, and they can be delivered to your home and you'll be able to access all of them through the one machine. Videotron already offers its TV subscribers greater interaction with what they watch, like participation in game shows. Soon that interaction will extend to ordering and paying for goods on TV. It's no wonder the cable companies are spending £7,000 million digging a path to our doors. A leading businessman urged the government today to keep its Eurosceptics under control. BT chairman Ian Vallon said their xenophobic posturing was damaging the British economy. He told the CBI conference it's vital that Britain stays at the heart of European decision-making. Two cabinet ministers, Kenneth Clark and Michael Heseltine, assured them that's exactly what the government is doing. Our industrial correspondent Stephen Cape reports from Harrogate. Again, welcome to Harrogate. Most of Britain's exports end up in Europe. 
and the president of the Board of Trade's message to anti-Europeans was aimed at those in the Tory party as well as outside. Today he addressed business leaders at the CBI, telling them that the relationship with the community was now being put at risk. We will serve ourselves not at all if the language with which we describe our continental partners, the imagery in which we paint them, and the insularity with which we attempt to rewrite the history of the past 40 years has the effect of alienating ourselves. It's but later at a news conference, ideas. he wouldn't criticize cabinet colleagues for their anti-European stance at the Tory party conference. But the chairman of BT, Ian Vallance, was more forthright in his condemnation of anti-Europeans. I and many of my business colleagues despaired at some of the damaging and xenophobic political posturing in Westminster over the past year. A row over Europe has been simmering for several days after the CBI Director General angered some politicians with his pro-European comments. But better news came from the Chancellor. Despite confusing economic figures recently, he remained upbeat. Currently, uh, we're the only major economy in Europe showing signs of recovery, and the figures, uh, by and large, if you take a detached from a few of them, uh, are quite good. No comment on the budget, but CBI leaders believe the Chancellor has taken on their concerns over the need for more investment in industry. Stephen Cape News at 10, Harrogate. The Health Secretary, Virginia Bottomley, gave a progress report today on her Health of the Nation campaign. Of 19 areas targeted, 16 are showing an improvement. But there are more fat people than before, and suicides are increasing. There's also disturbing news about teenage smokers. Apparently, health warnings aren't getting through. Here's our health editor, Lawrence McGinty. Breast screening is just the kind of success the government is looking for. Last year, 70% of eligible women were screened and over 6,000 cancers detected, well in line with the health department's target of cutting deaths from this disease by a quarter. Today, Virginia Bottomley was in optimistic mood about the government's Health of the Nation campaign. Very substantial progress has been made. We set out the 27 target areas. We have new information on 19. Uh, 16 uh, are going very well. There are three areas where we want to see more progress. Perhaps the most significant of those three areas is teenage smoking. Here, the government is not making headway and has left itself open to criticism. The Chancellor makes £85 million a year from the illegal sale of cigarettes to children. I call that living off immoral earnings. The government hoped teenage smoking would decline by 33% by next year. In fact, it's not changed in the past year. Suicides were targeted to drop 15% by the year 2000. In fact, they rose slightly. The target for obesity among men was a 25% reduction by the year 2005. In fact, in recent years, male obesity nearly doubled. Some people can bring their life into a new focus by losing weight. Jennifer Gadden lost over seven stones. The problem the government faces is whether it can succeed in persuading enough other people to follow her example. If not, the targets in health of the nation will fall by the wayside. The Defence Secretary, Malcolm Rifkin, will announce a cut in the nuclear firepower of Britain's new Trident submarines tomorrow. Some Tory MPs are annoyed that he's doing it in a public speech and not in Parliament. Tridents can carry more warheads than the Polaris they're replacing, but it's thought Mr Rifkin had decided against increasing the fleet's capacity. A multi-million pound plan to prevent Britain becoming the dunce of Europe was launched today by the National Commission on Education. But the government's already rejected two of its proposed reforms. Here's our Health of Home Affairs reporter, Harry Smith. The Commission wants to change the way Britons are educated, starting at the bottom. At present, we spend less money on the early years than most advanced nations, even though it's been proved that nursery schooling reduces problems in later life, such as crime and vandalism. The report recommends nursery education for all from the age of three, scrapping A-levels in favour of a more broadly based exam, students paying more for university courses and reforming education authorities to bring in more industrialists. The government has already said it will cost too much. The Commission says the cost of ignoring its report could be far higher. I think that we will look rather stupid as a nation 
we would think economically, because what we're proposing is absolutely basic to economic success. And some of our social problems, like crime and hooliganism, etc., which are related to education, will get worse rather than better. The report has been welcomed by opposition parties and teachers unions, but the Commission says it must not be allowed to become a political football. This is a blueprint for the 21st century, with radical changes requiring long and careful debate. Harry Smith, News at 10, Central London. Tonight's main news again is that Mr Major has said Sinn Féin could be involved in Northern Ireland peace talks if the IRA calls a complete halt to violence. The Sinn Féin leader Gerry Adams claimed the government had already been talking to his party. And finally, anyone wanting to see the show at the end of Cromer Pier in Norfolk will have to wait a while. The end is no longer attached to the seafront, as Robin White reports. Cromer Pier had survived most things in its 93-year history, in real life and on film, in danger UXB with the help of a few special effects it was blown to pieces. In reality, the worst danger has been from fierce storms. Until last night, when winds of Force 12 ripped a small rig from its moorings and drove it into the pier, smashing a 30-metre section of the Victorian structure into the sea cutting off the pavilion theatre and the lifeboat launching station. Along the coast, the rig platform was later washed ashore. Coast guards warned shipping to watch for more debris. Engineers have been assessing the damage today and sightseers have been out in force. Yeah, it is a really shame, yes, yes. Um, I hope they repair it. The pier's owners, the local council, say they will. Perhaps even in time for the theatre's next production in April. Meanwhile, they're considering putting up a temporary bridge spanning the gap so that at least the lifeboat can be launched. That's News at 10 tonight. Until tomorrow, from all of us here at ITN, good night. Wet and windy spell of weather in the northwest, particularly in the northwest of Scotland, all associated with this weather front. Now that's coming south across Scotland. To come to a halt, though, I think, across Northern Ireland and southern parts of Scotland. Clear weather behind by the end of the night. And a frosty night, I think, in the south. But that will be going fairly readily, as will any early morning mist patches. And most of England and Wales really quite fine, dry, bright, though sunshine rather on the hazy side. Now there's that. Band of cloud and outbreaks have been stretching from Ireland across Northern Ireland into southern Scotland, perhaps into Cumbria and Northumberland as well. To the north, quite bright, with a few showers up in the far northwest. And through the day, you'll find this band of cloud just nudging slowly northwards into central Scotland, nudging across Northern Ireland as the rain slowly but surely begins to peter out. But England and Wales, for the most part, ending the day as it began, fine and dry. Maybe fine and dry, but not particularly warm. Temperatures, I think, Good average around 11 degrees Celsius, that's 52 degrees Fahrenheit. A little bit breezy in places, particularly in the north, but nothing like as windy as it's been earlier today. That's it from me. Good evening.